All right, so today we are happy to have Igor Plevano, who will be telling us about discrete symmetries and mass shift in lattice Hamiltonian approach to the string domain. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Uh, uh, maybe some of you noticed that uh, two days ago we submitted a paper on a paper on the archive. And this is a somewhat new subject to me. I never really worked on lattice gauge theory, so I had to. So the paper is with uh, Ross Dempsey, Silvio Pufo, and Bernardo Zan, who are all traveling now. Uh, but maybe some of them will be on Zoom. Oh, I see Bernardo. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, so it's a kind of ancient subject. Uh, Schwinker model is about as old as I am. <laughs> uh, the paper was in 1962, which is the year I was born. Uh, uh, okay, uh, and uh, and this, of course, has been over the years a kind of uh, classic model for uh, for many issues. Anomaly, the the binding of quarks into singlet objects and things like that. Uh, so I will review a little bit uh, the continuum formulation of the Schwinger model, and some facts were already known from Schwinger's original paper, but uh, there was a burst of activity right around 47 years ago, uh, which used bosonization, and there were papers by uh, Coleman, Jekyll, and Susskind, and Coleman, which clarified a lot of the issues, but then the model so the massless model is exactly solvable and just reduces to a free Schwinger boson, but the massive model is not exactly solvable. So there are still some approximations needed. And, uh, and that was part of the motivation to set up this model on the lattice. So, so the first, uh, the first uh, formulation of this model on the lattice was uh, Banks, uh, Banks, Susskind, uh, this kind uh, of COVID. I'm not sure this was really against alphabetic, but two of them were at Tel Aviv University, which was the first two authors, and Kogut was at Cornell. Uh, this was uh, summer of uh, 75. I just completed seventh grade then. Uh, I knew little. I was just a seventh grader in Harkov or Harki. Uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, I will review a little bit of this paper. Uh, and they mainly worked on strong coupling expansions. And then this, this theme continued over many years. And actually, recently there has been uh, a kind of return to the Schwinger model, but from a totally different angle. People are even trying to build devices which experimentally implement a Schwinger model. So, and also it's a playground for DMRG, density matrix normalization group, matrix product states, and so on. So very active field again. And we were reading these papers. This actually was not our intention to work on Schwinger model. We were trying to do something a bit more complicated. But then uh, in the process of learning the Schwinger model, we discovered that something was really a bit missing, even it's a bit hard to believe that over these 47 years, something would be missing. So modulo one paper by Beruta and collaborators, Beruta, Grignani, Semenov, and Sadana, which is somewhat related to what I'm going to say. And this paper is rather little known. Uh, this was not pointed out. And certainly the mass shift was not pointed out even in that paper. And I think this affects actually a lot of numerical work that's being done now. So I hope that this will be useful to some other workers in the field. Basically, in a nutshell, we will see that the lattice parameter, which was usually identified with a continuum mass, actually is shifted <coughs> by, uh, by something. So, so the, this mass shift, just to jump to the punchline, there is this lattice mass parameter M let which is usually identified like this, but in fact, there should be E squared A over A. And this rather dramatically changes the strong coupling, the nature of strong coupling expansions and so on. And here E is of course the electric charge. 
which has dimensions of mass and one plus one dimensions, and A is just the lattice space. So I want to explain how we arrive at this. But first, let me just, since Schwinger model is not something that's often discussed here, I just want to write down a few facts about it. And also, yeah, please interrupt. I, I hope it will be discussion style. So QED in one plus one dimensions, one plus one dimensions, uh, the Lagrangian is just minus one over four E squared. F minu, F minu. Right then, uh, and there is plus the fermionic term. Uh, so we take just one Dirac fermion in, in one plus one dimension. So we will have I times D slash minus A slash minus M times Psi. And then uh, in one plus one dimensions, you can also add the, a theta term, theta over two pi times epsilon menu F menu. So this is the special to one plus one. Right? And the other terms are of course the same as in, uh, in three plus one, right? And here psi will be just the doublet and I'll write this as psi, uh, in this form, which will, why, why I call these even and odd will become clear in a second. And of course we have, F mu is uh, D mu A nu minus D nu A nu. And this in uh, uh, one plus one dimensions can be written as just epsilon mu nu times F, where F is basically F zero one, just the only non-trivial component. Okay, so, so Schwinger studied uh, the vacuum polarization for this model and discovered that it has rather dramatically different properties than in three plus one, and it basically makes uh, a component of the A field uh, uh, a massive boson. But, uh, uh, but then there, were, uh, there was a lot of work still using this original fermionic formulation, uh, and I won't review this. Uh, so let me just jump to the, since I don't have an infinite amount of time, I'll jump to the bosonization formula. So we know that bosonization, uh, bosonization maps the Dirac fermion psi. So one, uh, one Dirac fermion in one plus one dimensions to just the real scalar phi, scalar phi. And the map is uh, roughly speaking that psi, psi left is e to the i uh, uh, square root of two square root of i phi left and similar to phi right. So many, since many people work in one plus one dimensions, this should be very familiar, right? And the formula that will be particularly useful to us uh, will be how do you map the currents, right? So, so for example, if you look at the, so we have this interaction minus a mu times j mu, right? And j mu, which is psi bar times gamma mu psi, right? This, this actually maps to one over square root of pi times epsilon mu nu times d nu phi. Okay, then uh, a little miracle happens when you multiply it by, uh, minus a, uh, by minus a mu. So one thing to notice is immediately, so d mu j mu by this formula is identical is zero, right? Because d mu d nu, the anti-symmetry in derivatives and epsilon mu will cancel out. So you get an identical zero. And then if you integrate by parts, so this, this term here will become minus a mu times epsilon mu nu, mu phi, one over root pi. 
and then you can integrate this by parts, and then you get d nu a mu, and then you get just f mu, nu, right? So you basically get as a result, this is this after integration by parts becomes minus one half f nu epsilon d nu times phi over root phi, right? Which is equal to just f phi over root phi. Okay, so that's this gauge interaction and the free uh, the free Dirac. Uh, the other terms will be straightforward because just the free uh, kinetic term just maps to d phi squared, right? So after this uh, auxiliary manipulation, we see that this this uh, Lagrangian can be written as one over so Lagrangian in the bosonized form will be one over two e squared f squared plus one half d phi squared plus phi over root phi, right? And then the other piece of the bosonization formula is, uh, so this is all for the massless term, right? So let me just ignore for now, let's just set theta equal to zero and m is equal to zero. And that's all you have, right? Uh, so now you see that it's a, a completely quadratic. So it's a minor miracle. And people before then were suffering through a lot of fermionic calculations, and but all of that fell in place after this bosonization. And then you can just integrate out f, right? Here you've set to zero the mass, right? Yeah, I, I said. Oh, yeah, sorry. I said <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just explaining why m equals zero theory is exactly solvable, right? Then you can just integrate out integrate out uh, f, basically eliminated by the equation of motion. And then you just get uh, the following Lagrangian, just L phi, uh, one half d phi squared minus d squared phi squared divided by two pi. Right? And this gives a free scalar of, of a mass. So this is the what people often call Schwinger boson. Schwinger boson. And its mass is uh, um, Schwinger, which is e over, uh, e over root pi. Which remember that E is not dimensionless, E has dimensions of mass. So this, this all matches. And okay, so that, that's this exact solution of the. So people often talk about this as a model of confinement, but in fact, this massless theory is actually a screening theory. Uh, in, in, because uh, a fractional charge can actually be screened by integer charges. I'm not sure I should get into, <laughs> into this story, but so in fact, this so for m equals zero, uh, for m equals zero, any fractional charge is screened. Charge screened. And I, I learned that in the process of working on a paper also long ago in 95 with uh, David Gross, Andrei Smilga, and Andrei Matitsen, uh, where we have a clear explanation of this. Basically, you can sort of write, uh, you can go to the A1 equals zero page. And then you get like a very simple theory for um, so this effect of Lagrangian. So now you don't integrate out f, you integrate out phi, you get some effect of Lagrangian, which is one half d1 a zero squared plus e squared over two pi times a zero squared. So it's as if you have, uh, so you have this, uh, uh, you know, screened potential, right? It's like a massive colonic field and it gives uh, exponential damping of the colonic force. Okay, so now, uh, but this is a bit of a side sideline for me. Uh, and then what about adding the, the, uh, the mass term? The mass term uh, looks more complicated, right? So. So the mass term, which is uh, minus psi bar psi, uh, 
that bosonizes into the following interesting expression, uh, which is uh, which is uh, electric charge times to the gamma over two pi to the three halves times cosine of uh, square root pi pi minus one. So once you add this uh, mass term here, you see that you get something more complicated and the theory is not exactly solvable because of this cosine phi interaction. But still one can develop, uh, develop say expansion in, in M over E. This is really a kind of strong coupling expansion for a small mass. And, so this is one of the techniques that is being used. And then here you can get some correction order M over E. So, so, so this was a very hot topic in the mid seventies. Any questions about it? This is just in the continuum now, right? Or, or yeah, so far I'm just discussing completely continuum model. Okay, so now, uh, that's not something that, I think that story is more or less completely uh, clear uh, what to do there. Um, but now what about the, the putting this model uh, using lattice gauge theory to formulate this model? So, so that's what I'll do next. Okay, so, so, um, so here, the original formulation, so I will not use the Euclidean formulation, I will use the so-called lattice Hamiltonian formulation, which is not very widely used by the current lattice people. Somehow this Hamiltonian formulation was picked up a lot by, uh, by the, in some sense, many body theories in the last few years, but not so much by the professional lattice gauge theory. And, and the reason is that this, because there is a fermion, the space of states grows exponentially with the number of lattice sites. And it's rather hard. The lore is that it's incredibly hard to diagonalize it because of this exponential growth of states. But in the meantime, computers have improved. And also, and we actually obtained some pretty nice convergent results even for what you can do on a cluster at Princeton University or even on a laptop. So some things are quite doable. But the, the number one question is how do you formulate the uh, formula, uh, fermion without doubling, right? That's sort of one, <laughs> one big question. And the bright idea that Kogat and Suskind had in around 74, 75, is the idea of staggered fermion. So if you, if you st uh, just write down more precisely the, so I'm just going to discuss free fermion for now. Bosonization. And then this has the action rate, which is integral d to x times pi bar u psi. Right. And then there is, uh, there is of course, minus m psi bar psi. But at first, you can just even forget about this term and just focus on this term. Right. So the basis that people usually use is take gamma, so it's not the chiral basis, but you take gamma zero to be sigma three, which is one minus one, and take gamma one to be I sigma two. Then the chirality matrix, gamma zero, gamma one, just be sigma one. So it's uh, the risk of this, this matrix. So it's not like the, what we're used to, but this is what comes in very handy for this formulation. Right. And then the idea of the staggered, uh, so staggering, the staggering idea uh, is to not put both components. So when we write uh, psi, right, there is the upper and lower component. And the idea of staggering is to put the upper component on only even sides of this one dimensional lattice and side and the lower component on odd sides. So, so I have a lattice like this, 
number the size zero, one, two, three, right? And uh, and here we put on with psi even, uh, sorry, psi odd here and psi even here. Right. And then the so in this basis, the equation of motion will be psi odd dot is equal to minus dx psi even and psi even dot is dx psi odd. I confess that not I don't vouch for all my signs, but hopefully some of them are correct. But then uh, so here here is the so then how you put it. On the lattice, this becomes actually extremely simple, uh, and you get a, a completely standard hopping term on the lattice. So after you put these even fermions on the even numbered sides, you get the following Hamiltonian: this free massless Hamiltonian, which is minus i one over two a sum of i n dagger. Minus one minus chi, uh, chi n plus one chi n, and you and you get. Uh, so why is this correct? So you basically see that. So when you try to determine the equation of motion, like what is chi n dot, right? It's equal to i. Is a commutator h with chi n, and you find that this is equal to minus one over two a times chi n plus one minus chi n minus one. So you indeed see that uh, that the commutator, so the derivative, so it's like the uh, discretization of this equation because the odd fermion derivative only knows about the the difference on, on the two even sides. And then, uh, so this is the, the discretization of the massless fermion, and then you can determine the band structure. I'm, I'm far from expert on this band, band structure, uh, but you can basically find that, uh, uh, so, so the single particle energy will be E of t, there is lattice momentum, right, will be basically sine plus or minus absolute value sine p, I think, over 2a. Okay, uh, so if you plot, and p can uh, go from, say, minus pi over 2 to plus 3 pi over 2, so you get the uh, this kind of picture, right? And uh, and the Fermi surface sits at these two points, right? This is p equal zero, zero, and this will be p equal to uh, pi, right? And uh, so so then uh, to get the and here you get like a left moving one, and here you get the right moving one. So, so this is the, the picture. So when you fill this up, you get the, so if you have a half filling situation, then you get a relativistic fermion. So, and then when you turn on the mass, then you open a gap right at the Fermi surface. So you get, so when the turn on mass, and you actually do something like this here, so here, right? So then indeed, like you, it's clear that you have to fill only sort of these levels and leave these empty, right? That's the usual Dirac C. And basically at half filling, then you get uh, uh, the, the relativistic formula of mass set. Okay, one, one other comment is that in this basis, uh, if you add the mass term, it looks like this. So this mass term, H mass, looks like, I'll call this M lattice, sum over N, 
So it's actually staggered. It's sum minus one to the n by n dagger from zero to, I mean, usually here you have in mind just an infinite lattice, but uh, what we did in practice is we took off on a periodic lattice of, of uh, two n sites. Okay, so this is this classic thing. Uh, yeah, very beautiful. And it certainly connects to condensed matter physics. Like if you go back to Subir's lectures in the fall, he discussed, this is one of the first things he discussed. You may be a little bit confused by this I. So there is an I in front of the hopping term, but it can actually be removed. You can remove this I uh, by just some transformation. So I can remove and remove uh, I by sending I n to I to the n chi n and chi n dagger uh, chi n dagger then goes to minus I to the n chi n. Then this I will go away and and you'll just get like the usual thing with a plus sign here. And this is what you see in the treatments of Hubbard model, like all these. Uh, different from ionic models. And there usually the C of P will be cosine. So you just shift uh, P a little, but the physics doesn't change. So what is uh, somewhat peculiar about this is that, uh, so now we're going to gauge this model, right? So we gauge this model. Oh, uh, so one thing that you read, like there is a ni very nice uh, paper by Lenny from 77, and you see that this, for example, this uh, mass term is staggered. And uh, uh, so the original translation, translation by two sides uh, in X, in the X coordinate corresponds to shift by two sides, by two sides. Okay, and shift by one side is a discrete chiral transformation because uh, it inter really interchanges psi even and psi odd, right? So shift by one side, uh, shift by one like the space in K, that like essentially discrete chiral symmetry. That, and that's sort of well known. It took us a while to fish it out of the literature. Transformation, but uh, but then it seems like people kind of made a little bit of a mistake with this, which is uh, very surprising. But uh, so uh, so let me uh, then recoup what we've done. Uh, essentially, you have a picture where the doublet doesn't sit on a single site, but is spread over a pair of sites, right? So what used to be one space-time point is just becomes two. Okay, and then the question is, how do you gauge this model? Because usually you would gauge, you would assume that these two sit on one point and you would introduce some kind of connections, but that's not what they do. They actually introduce the gauge connections on all sides because that's clearly the, the nice thing to do. And, but maybe there is something buried in there also, but that's, uh, that's basically the, the gauge formulation. So then, uh, so let me then discuss the gauge field. That's also extremely simple. So let me separately discuss the gauge field. Uh, So suppose we now look at free gauge field and then couple it to the Fermi. So free gauge field, you, uh, but we do it in the Hamilton. You, you probably all have seen the Euclidean picture, right? Where on, say in the Euclidean picture, you would have a two dimensional lattice and then each link you would have some U matrix, which is an element of the gauge group. And then you add the plaquette term. That's not what you do in this Hamiltonian formulation. You you have, uh, say this is again, zero, one, two, three, and then you add these uh, directed links. 
Okay, and and uh, and then let's just write down what f zero one is, right? F zero one will be a one dot minus the x five, just in the continuum picture. Sorry, yeah, where I call uh, a one, let me call a, and a zero, the Coulomb potential, I call phi. Just, just for gravity of notation. And then you discretize this. When you discretize this, you basically have these a n links. So this would be called a, uh, a zero, a one, a two, a one, a three. And, uh, and then you write this F01, when you discretize, you write this as A, A, uh, and dot minus I am plus one minus phi n. Right, this just discretizes the, the derivative here. So then the Lagrangian, uh, yeah, I'm setting A equal one temporarily, but then the Lagrangian will be L will be integral dt one over two e squared times sum over sum over n a n dot plus i n minus i one whole squared right and then the dual uh, then the momenta conjugate to a n are basically the electric fields. They're often called L sub n. They're just some generators, but let's just call them E n for, for the moment. E n will be just d L by d a n dot, right? And that will be just a n dot plus phi, phi n minus phi n plus one over E squared. Okay, so then, then it's just from here, it's just a simple exercise to derive the Hamiltonian, right? You just write down the Hamiltonian, which is sum over n, uh, these momenta, the n times a n dot minus the Lagrangian. And, uh, uh, and basically you, you get, uh, you get the following expression, just sum e squared over two, e n squared. But then you get a term which is uh, uh, proportional to these phi's. So you get a term which is uh, plus sum over n, by n times uh, minus e n plus e n minus one. But let, let me just make one small step and couple these phi's to, to the charges of the fermions, right? So when you couple, so couple to these fermions or some other charged field, you will get the term which is uh, sum over n phi n times q n. But these are the fermionic charges. And then you pick up another term here, which is QN. And this is an extremely important term, which actually was not spelled out in the original papers. Uh, and since phi N is kind of like a Lagrange multiplier, this gives the Gauss law on the, on the lattice. So, so and this is a very crucial element of this construction, the Gauss law. So, uh, so varying with respect to phi N, we, So on each side, it's kind of uh, implementing discrete Gauss law. So we get the constraints. Gauss law, which tells us that Qn, uh, that En minus En minus one is equal to Qn for each for each n. And this is a very powerful thing in, 
uh, in uh, one plus one dimensions, right? Because once you know the charges, you can, on an open line, you can just then completely eliminate these ENs, okay? And, uh, and in definition of this Gauss law, there are some, some very big subtleties buried, and this is what part of the reason we wrote this paper. Okay, so now let me just finally write down what people were working with. And uh, uh, so let me write down the Lagrangian that you see now in many papers by people like Ignacio Sirac and collaborators, Francois Strata. They took something. So the first time this was spelled out was in the, that we could find was in a paper by Hamer. There was a man named Chris Hamer, I think in Australia, he worked mostly in Australia in 1997. And he wrote the complete uh, sort of system to work with. And this is the system. So, so one, one uh, just notational thing, often people call EN LN, right? And LN is just a momentum conjugate to the H field. So you can just, Right, this is minus I D by D A N. And then this A N is made compact. That's the compact QED. These gauge variables, so namely A N is identified with A N plus two pi. And then you also introduce U N, which is just the exponential of this A N on each link. And then, uh, so, so for, so here is the complete story. You get the Hamiltonian, which is e squared a over two, sum over n, ln plus theta over two pi squared, minus i over two a. Then there is the hopping term with the gauge fields inserted, sum over n, i and dagger u n, plus one minus chi and plus one dagger u n dagger and this in this case u is just an, an element of u one group but this obviously generalizes to non-abelian groups right and then the this m lat term m lat which is sum over n and now here is how they wrote the Gauss law. This is where uh, a lot of subtleties come in. You, you write the kind of staggered Gauss law. Like when you write this QN for the fermion naively, QN is just chi n dagger chi n plus some shift CN, which is a kind of normal ordering shift. If, if you set all CN to zero, you get the kind of bad answer. <laughs> so you have to, so here is the, the what, what was taken in the uh, implicitly, I think in the original papers and more explicitly in this Hamer paper. And then when you read the current papers, they all take that pretty much, is the staggered Gauss law, which is, so they take this Gauss law, but with the definition that QN is chi n dagger chi n minus uh, one minus minus one to the n divided by two. So this differs between even and odd sides. So on even sides, so even sides, you get just the naive thing. Q and dagger, chi and dagger, chi n, but on odd sides, you get Q n is chi and dagger, chi n minus one. Okay, and this obviously is not invariant under what you would call the original chiral symmetry, right? Just this minus one breaks the, in some sense, the chiral symmetry from the original definition. Now the question is, why did they do this? It's actually very hard to find any derivation of it, except that uh, this matched the original strong coupling expansion of Banks et al. They, they actually never wrote this out, but they did just 
strong coupling expansion. So the reason this kind of works very nicely is because if you, so if this allows in particular, so if you occupy, if fermions occupy outsides only, in other words, that the state will be just state, uh, what we'll call it, state big phi will involve product over odd n and dagger acting on the vacuum. Then, uh, then Q is zero on even size and Q is also zero on odd size because of this minus one. And then all LNs can be taken to be zero. Just for simplicity, I can just for now set theta equal to zero and then, and then LN is equal to zero. And that's good state because when you make E squared very large, you clearly, this is the state that you're most uh, sort of sensitive to. So this agrees with the strong coupling expansion. Strong coupling. Uh, of uh, banks at all. Well, what happens if you take a space time lattice and with space time staggered fermions, where, and then the Gauss's law just comes from the time like links? So it should be completely unambiguous what to do there. Yeah, that I haven't worked through. Yeah, if you do space time staggering, yeah. are you going to get? An extra doubling of fermions. Uh, uh, I thought you maybe get two. Right, I guess. Yeah. 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 The one nice thing about this Hamiltonian is you don't get an extra doubling. Uh -huh. So you get like a one Dirac fermion on the nose just from this lattice. I mean, uh, yeah. But to be honest, I don't. I didn't do what you were suggesting. Uh -huh. A very nice thing to do. But uh, but this is like was rehashed in many many papers, starting with this uh, and. Uh, and it sort of works, but then you immediately run into a problem with this discrete chiral symmetry. Because suppose you try to implement the discrete chiral symmetry transformation, which is uh, uh, just literally shift by one side. So if you instead uh, implement this the discrete chiral transformation, which is chi n to going to chi n plus one, then you're suddenly instead of, so here with this state, you get basically all qn is equal to zero, right? But after this transformation, you will get the state, which is a phi tilde, which is now a product over even, so it's kind of like zero. And then you get like QNs, which are uh, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. They're not z anywhere zero anymore. So you get uh, basically QN is equal to one uneven. So it's, and QN is equal to minus one on odd sides. And then the solution of the Gauss law constraint will be uh, will be basically something like E zero is equal to minus one half E one is equal to plus one half zero is equal to E two is equal to minus this kind of checkerboard structure where you get so you get minus one half here plus one half here and so on. But then you say, oh my God, is this for units or? Yeah, so that's a very, I'll say more about this. this. This one half really means that you are now in the theta equal to pi vacuum. You're no longer in the theta equal zero vacuum. So you really also shifted the vacuum of the theta angle by pi. But for now, let's just worry about the fact that the energy of the state will be dramatically different from the energy of the state. You suddenly pick up the, the gigantic energy of order e squared a. So you will get basically this energy e tilde, which will be e squared a over two. N is the number of lattice sites over four. And, uh, and basically it's very bad breaking of this discrete chiral symmetry. 
So this is, uh, so that, what is the solution of this problem? And this, this was for the case supposed to be the realization of the theory with massless formula, right? Yes. Just small confusion, like, is there an issue that the chiral symmetry in this language squared is a translation instead of the identity? Uh, yeah, I mean, there, are, but, but it's still it's there. Not, yeah, it's, it's still there, there, right, for states that are translationally invariant. It's, Probably you would say that the one unit does translate over these two units is small. Yeah, but because it's a lattice spacing or something. Yeah, it's uh, but for translational invariant states, it's it's just identity. So. Okay. Yeah, I think this does realize that. Yeah, there, there is one thing I forgot to mention. I'm sorry, like just a very basic thing about the Schwinger anomaly. That of course the anomaly breaks the chiral symmetry to begin with because. Yeah. Like if you go back to these bosonization formula, right? There was this J mu five, right? And that uh, was just uh, so J mu five was just one of our root pi d mu five. And then the, if you go back to this bosonized action, the anomaly uh, you basically had the equation of motion that box phi or d squared phi is equal to one over pi times f. This is the Schwinger anomaly, right? Because this is just uh, uh, this is just the divergence of the axial current. So this, of course, introduces some issues into like, should you have any chiral symmetry to begin with and so on. But nevertheless, uh, there is this big asymmetry here. And what's, what's the solution? The solution is uh, take, Take a mass term, which is, uh, so this is all a big asymmetry for m light equal to zero. Big asymmetry for m light equal to zero. But then if you just take uh, m light equal to uh, uh, instead, forget about this and take m light equal to minus e squared a over a. Then suddenly the energy of this state and the energy of this state will become identical. And the only issue is that this state has these half, half integer valued uh, else. Yeah, it should have been all zero. Okay, the half integer else just really mean that you're in the same day equal to pi by three. And so because we expect that when we do a chiral symmetry, it's theta shift by pi. Right, right, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I think this is all to be expected. So it really maps a state in one sector of the theory to a state in another sector, which is theta equal to pi, but the energies will all match up. And then, so this gives you an idea why this works. And then in the paper, we have a more concrete realization of what is going on. We basically, you can just, so this is just a kind of, uh, partial argument, but then you can do a much more complete argument where you uh, essentially accompany chi n this transformation by a transformation of ln going to ln plus minus one to the n over two, and then accompany and then say that to say that plus phi. And then you can check that the Hamiltonian after this transformation is is equal to itself. So basically the, the upshot is that we want to identify this new point, this new value with the massless theory. And uh, so, so now let me just try to convince you that this actually has pragmatic importance. Uh, I don't wanna go on forever, but he, here is one thing that we, uh, so, so the first Can thing- I ask a question, Igor? Yes. Imagine the fermion has charge, which is not one, say two. So that should be easy to implement on the lattice. You just put U square wherever you put U. Yeah, yeah. Then, but then the structure of the symmetries is a little bit different. Do you see it in your lattice formulation? Yeah, I mean, we, we do have comments on this. We, we actually, to begin with, we actually started with wanting to study Q equal two theory 
for the reason basically you say that it has two separate sectors. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so the Q equal two, uh, so this Q equal two theory, uh, indeed, like then you just modify this by putting u squared here. And then this shift, uh, roughly speaking, you then in this formula, you send e to eq. But then uh, in some sense, it's a very good example because what happens is that in these two sectors of the theory and the lattice, uh, so there will be sort of trivial, so there are two sectors of the space. Sector one is where all ends are even, even integers, integers. And, two, and sector two is where all ln are odd integers. And uh, but both of them are honestly present in the skew equal to theory. So these are the what people call two different universes. And then you see that this discrete chiral transformation maps you from even LN to other LN sectors and completely preserves the energy. So then uh, instead of shifting theta by pi, you, you can sort of think of this as kind of theta equal pi sector uh, of the theory. But then you indeed shift. Uh, so in this Q equal two theory, you will just have this two will disappear. You'll have this transformation, and there is an exact mapping between the sort of trivial universe and non-trivial universe. So these two sectors are two vacuum of the same theory. Yeah, two vacuum of the same Q equal two theory. Right. Yeah, they differ by by this subtle global property. So that, that's because you have like a gauge symmetry breaking with a field of charge two, and then and then you have a C two gauge. Symmetry. Well, the, yeah, I mean, in this lattice formulation, it's actually completely clear because once you see what how this works, basically every time you act with this operator, you shift the uh, the wave function on each link by two units of e to the i a, so you preserve the mod two property kind of. So the Hamiltonian will like just map you within each sector, but this discrete chiral transformation maps you from one sector to that. There is now a lot of, uh, it has to do with these, they're actually more rigorous, much more rigorous people than me writing papers about this, like about this structure of these two different universes. The, the reason people call them universes, which I think originally Hellerman coined this title, is that you see that even in finite volume, you see that they don't mix at all. And here you indeed see it even in discrete finite volume, they're really totally disconnected sectors. So Nati, did this sound okay? It sounds okay. I'm curious whether a Wilson loop with charge one, which is a good operator in the theory, acting on all of space, does that move you between these two states or not? Yeah, yeah, I think it moves you between sectors, yeah. So in, in what sense are these two different universes? Well, I think, uh, yeah, the Wilson loop is just a product of use around, yeah, so that's that's a kind of, but is this one of these topological operators that moves you from, yeah, it's, I think it does move you between the two sectors. But apart from this operator there, I mean, the, the dynamics in the Hamiltonian, like when you do the diagonalization, that will not mix the sector. Okay, but the discrete chiral symmetry does go between the two, which is sort of interesting. So you have this degeneracy at this special point. So, so now let me just, the practical significance of this. So, what you read in Hamer's paper, this actually goes back to Banks et al. and Hamer just worked out higher orders. So one thing that uh, you look at this energy gap, uh, for example, if you want to, so there is some lowest ground state that you can just compute by exact diagonalization. Uh, so my collaborators all discretized, they put it on the computer 
and even in the so so the the problem with the periodic is uh, not fully finite Hilbert space because there is the zero mode the so-called average electric field which can take any value but there is so additional uh, so you cannot fully integrate out a lens and there is this average electric field electric field which people call which is just sum over a lens divided by the number of lattice sites and you need to in principle include all of them but in practice uh, it converges extremely fast when you put the cutoff on this average electric field so you can get very precise numbers and we saw like at this point we saw much much better properties of the convergence of the theories and also behavior in the weak coupling limit and so on uh, but maybe there will be some other talk on this. So let me just state the strong coupling expansion results. So this is, uh, so the difference in the energies, the first excited state and the second was E squared or A over two times some dimensionless number omega one minus omega zero. And this delta omega, so the first few terms were in Tom Banks's Paper with Lenny and John Covert. Uh, to y over one plus two m to mu minus two times five plus two mu uh, y squared divided by one plus two mu u. And uh, and then they had even up to y to the fifth, which the formula this mu dependent and mu is just the dimensionless term left. Yeah, it's two amlet, amlet divided by e squared a. So what Rachel, people are I'm only... still confused. I'm still confused about what you told me because if I to consider the pure gauge theory, then it clearly well we know what it does, and there's a question of whether there is confinement here or not. And I think you said that if you put external charges, they can just uh, you uh, you can screen there by popping charges out of the vacuum. Now, if we only have even charges, can we screen an odd charge or not? Yeah, you can screen the odd charge for sure. Yeah, that, that, that is, uh, you can make this argument in the continuum because when you saw, when you look at the equation for, for the you know, Coulomb potential, it just has the effective mass term and then when you look at the basically charge and the charge potential, uh, it, it doesn't, it, you know, it can be charge one half, one quarter, whatever. You see that the, the screen, you get the screening potential. This is for the massless case. For the massless case. Yeah, the, but if you, have, if you get the mass wrong, say, then you probably wouldn't see this. I mean, like if they continue. Yeah, yeah, this is all done on small lattices, so I I don't know. Uh, yeah, this could be a test of what you <laughs> what we're suggesting. Uh, so we didn't look at big lattices and things like that for for practice. In the continuum, you do see that for m equals zero, you get the screening potential. Right. Yeah, the potential looks like this, right? Uh, it starts out like this and then it levels off exactly. Right? This V of E, E prime, E bar prime, like a quark anti quark potential will be one over mu times one minus E to the minus uh, one over M Schwinger minus M Schwinger uh, to the distance x. So you see at short distances, you get a kind of linear potential and then it gets screened. It, it's a pretty amazing phenomenon. I mean, uh, but, but it's true. Um, yeah, if, it, if you individualize the boson, then you get the coupling, like a two calvert field with the gauge boson and then you get the massive gauge boson. Yeah, yeah, you can even get a massive gauge boson here yeah, from integrating uh, this it. Is, from this is quite clear. So consider the massive fermion. So if you separate them enough, it's clear that you can pop a pair out of the vacuum and screen the charge and the potential will be independent of separation because you exactly screened it. 
But if all you have available are fermions with charge two, I don't see the mechanism that allows you to screen it. Well, that's, that's the miracle. I mean, you see it from bosonization. If you, you get a kind of, um, I don't think it's completely screened. I think what's left is some kind of topological leftover, but, but the, it's true that no matter how many twos and minus twos you put, it will keep it odd. So, so it's like the, the charge one fermion is like a domain wall. I think it's, it's a domain wall between these two sectors. I mean, that's, that's I think, one way to think about it. But the interaction between the domain walls does go to zero at long, long distance. But imagine you don't have charge one, you only have even charges. Well, then, then screening is trivial. Then you just bind, uh, bind the negative opposite charge. And, but then the domain wall doesn't have any energy at all. But I mean, we've been worrying about exactly the same phenomenon in this adjoint GCD where it looks like you are screening the fundamentals in a similar way. Anyways, let, let me just very pragmatic thing, uh, something that anyone can do. Which is so. You, so, what were people doing? This is 75. You have this mu, this is dimensionless mass, and they would take uh, uh, the strong. Of course, you only have like three terms in those days. This was before it was automated. And people were trying to. Uh, to extrapolate this. Now, you this y is one over e, e a to the fourth power, right? So you want to extrapolate the series to infinite y based on the first three terms. Uh, and you also know that, uh, that the behavior of delta y as y becomes uh, delta omega as y becomes large should really be y to the one quarter. Because then, uh, then this lattice spacing will cancel and you will get that E1 minus E0 is just some number times electric charge, which is the only. So to have the good continuum limit, you have to impose this, this behavior. So you people like did some kind of a day and got basically pretty bad results, like uh, were not very convergent. And then even Hamer with his Y to the fifth got like very confusing results. But then so what we're saying is instead of plugging in, uh, so instead of saying mu equals zero, plug in mu equal to minus one quarter, which is our shifted mass. Then you get a totally different strong coupling series like delta omega is one half plus four y. All the coefficients are different. And to put in this behavior, you so to have this behavior, you really want to do a day on delta omega to the fourth power. Uh, so for example, for the series with these three terms, you do a day, a day one, two, sorry, a day two, one, day two, one, which ensures that this goes like y at large y. And then you find uh, amazingly uh, good results. I mean, maybe it's a fluke, but you find, for example, that this number here from this extrapolated expansion is uh, 19 over 188 to the one quarter power times E, which is approximately 0.56383 E. And the exact result, this is just a Schwinger boson sitting there, even, even on a small, just, just one Schwinger boson. So they, here you can test against the exact results. This is what Schwinger did for us. He knew that this exact result was just E over root pi. And this is 0 0.56419. Six four one nine. So this is really only zero point six percent. Oh, I, I just for fun redid it exactly the same, uh, the same 
calculation with mu equals zero. So for mu equals zero, uh, I got 36.3 percent off. Maybe precision here is a bit of a fluke, but let's just say. And then you can do the same thing for psi bar psi condensate. And uh, that's another thing you can extrapolate. They also, Hamer worked out this long series. We plugged it in, shifted mu to one quarter. So you know the exact value of psi bar psi. The continuum value is minus e to the omega. This is minus e to the Euler constant over two pi to the three halves, which is uh, about minus one six zero, and from this Pade business, I got uh, Pade gives minus zero point one six four. It seems like a consistently very strong effect. Uh, so here you get like two percent off, but for this is for mu equal to minus one quarter, and for mu equal zero, you get uh, like 40 something percent of, yeah, 42% of. But then the improvement doesn't stop here. There is a whole bunch, this is probably not a good time to go into numerical results, but you can see, for example, from, uh, from the plots in our paper, it's quite remarkable agreement for such a small lattice. Uh, for example, some people computed on a finite circle of length L, uh, the value of condensate, how it varies as a function of L. There was a, a famous Hattrick Hasatani paper, which finds this exact function. And, uh, and the numerical work on these fairly small lattices matches it extremely well. For example, that's, uh, and it only works after this shift. So, so basically that's, so I think the, I hope beyond this whole issue with the discrete chiral symmetry, there is also some pragmatic value to, to this, in particular those who are trying to test devices versus known solutions. The bottom line is that even without advanced techniques like mat matrix product states and DMRG, just almost on a laptop with full diagonalization, you can get very nice convergence to some of the known continuum results. And I think certainly for non exactly solvable model where you turn on mass to some intermediate value, you can then hopefully more can be done. Okay, thank you very much. What happens if you think about higher dimensional gauge theories? Do uh, you expect to have a similar effect? Yeah, we, uh, so definitely two plus one is in the game. <clears throat> in fact, uh, so one other thing that uh, Hamer did is a strong coupling expansion for just two plus one. Mm -hmm. Of course, the difficulty with two plus one to solve the Hamiltonian by full diagonalization is gonna be much harder because you cannot fully eliminate the, the LNs, right? Then you really have plaquette terms and so on. Well, but I'm, just, I'm just thinking, let's say, uh, I'm thinking space-time lattices. I mean, usually people think you should set M lat to zero in these simulations. Well, on space-time lattices, I'm not sure. Maybe that's the right thing to do, right? Yeah, I'm a little confused. Is, is, there, is there a relevant thing, the anomaly in the chiral current? That's yeah, the, yeah. It, it's really a manifestation of, of, a, of the anomaly, I think, this shift. Okay, but there, is an, there are anomalies in higher dimensions, in like well, in even, right. even dimensions. I mean, do you worry about the- Yeah, I, right. For example, and yeah, the whole anomaly structure is different. Uh, yeah, in two plus one, of course. But let's say in three plus one. You know, like yeah. uh, this very large uh, project to compute mm -hmm. the spectrum of hadrons, gauge theories. I mean, well, they don't usually use uh, staggered they fermions. They absolutely they, do. They do some. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I thought the staggered is very beautiful in the Hamiltonian because 
One thing that that's interesting is that if you take Hamiltonian for two plus one, and then the staggering works that are the minimal parity invariant theory has two two doublets, and you just put them on elementary square like sites one two three four, so you get an absolutely minimal theory from the Hamiltonian staggering. You don't. I mean, the advantage of the staggering, well, let's say in, in Monte Carlo, is you don't have to do any fine tuning. This is what people say. Mm -hmm. you know what to set the lattice mass to. And so you don't have to run a lot of different simulations with different values of the bare mass. And yeah, so here I think the, the, it's this subtlety with the Gauss law. I, I don't know how uh, the, what's the analogous thing to Gauss law in the, in the Euclidean. Here it's definitely what everyone was using. Uh -huh. uh, there was one exception, which was this very interesting paper from late 90s by uh, uh, Beruto, Semenov, Grignani, and Sadano. And they adopted the symmetric normal ordering. Uh, uh, so what they did is instead of this asymmetric normal ordering, they put minus one half everywhere. But then there were some issues indeed with the quantization of LNs and theta terms and so on. And, uh, but, but it, it was sort of along the lines that what I'm saying. So here it's sort of uh, closer to, to what we're saying, uh, but they didn't realize that one could use the old formula with the shifted mass because it's a pain to rework these for uh, these strong coupling formula. And we just plugged in mu equal to minus one quarter and suddenly saw this big improvement. So maybe this is another approach to this thing is to adopt this sort of uh, symmetric way of treating the Gauss law and so on. But, but it's, it's funny that even such a, what people would think is a totally settled problem. I think it does have to do with the chiral anomalies somehow, the, this shift. Is the, so hopefully to to be continued, but but the the two plus one there are available strong coupling expansions, and actually one of the confusing things. So they they implemented back in the nineties already uh, the calculation of psi bar psi in strong coupling expansion on the two plus one staggered lattice. This this is uh, yeah just just to give you an idea. So you basically put like one two three four. And this is this comp comprises uh, psi alpha, right? Where alpha is equal to one and two. So there are two two Dirac doublets. This is the model that uh, could have like this enhanced SU two cross SU two symmetry and so on. But when they actually computed the extrapolation and so on, they obtained a huge value of the condensate. Uh, this is one it was one of the complaints. Like the value of the condensate they got was like vastly more than in some numerical simulations. This is another paper by Hamer. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering if their condensate was actually right for the theory they were looking at because their theory has all these monopoles and, uh, and these monopoles can cause extra tendency to condense things. You know, there are these, as you know very well, there is this non-compact theory and this one was inherently worked out for compact theory. Uh, and there could be big differences between the two. Uh, the, yeah, there are a few papers that keep saying, uh, how can this condensate be so huge and so on. And so there are puzzles even in this, <laughs> this business. It's like orders of magnitude bigger. Yeah, here it's an analogous calculation to what we were doing here. And here the condensate agreed with the exact solution like within 2% or something, but not with the, not up to a factor of 10 to the four or something. So may, maybe there is some something we're missing. But this Hamiltonian method for strong coupling expansion, it's actually very efficient and uh, and but it hasn't been done for so long. Maybe good to just check some of the formula. <laughs> yeah.
there are no more questions, let's thank you, Armen.